As the province tries to get a handle on the surging real estate market in Ontario's capital city and the Greater Golden Horseshoe, it's turned its attention to some of the key players in those markets, realtors. And that brings Tim Hudak back to our studio. The former Ontario PC Party leader is now CEO of the Ontario Real Estate Association, and he's here to help us understand why the government's looking to change some of what his members do. Tim, it's good to see you good again. Good to see you again, yes, too. Yes, thanks for coming in. Let's do a, a bit of a fact file here just to sort of set the stage for our discussion. You bet. Sheldon, if you would, this graphic, please. Uh, the province has announced that they will review the rules real estate agents are required to follow. They will also review two practices in particular, which we'll discuss, double ending and paper flipping. And they will also better educate the public on the public's right in a real estate transaction. Some of what the Wynn government has unveiled in its so-called fair housing plan. Just before we talk about details, uh, I'm always curious to find out how much face time, if any, people who are affected by government policy get with either the premier or the minister in charge before announcements are made. How did that work for you? Really well. I, I guess it probably depends, but I got to say, because um, you never know, right? I leave the world of politics, different party, and how will it be received? It was, it was very generous. We had over an hour and a half meeting with the premier herself, Minister Sousa on a couple of occasions, municipal affairs minister, housing minister, and senior staff. I actually counted this. We had 16 separate meetings with either ministers or their senior staff in the run hmm. of the budget. And I'm grateful for that. Now, given how you and the Premier were such BFFs when you were in <laughs> politics together, was that somewhat surprising? It, it um, well, because we kind of were, right? I mean, we actually, well, we, we had our worked. wars. Yeah. We had our good meetings behind the <laughs> scenes. So was it surprising? Actually, actually, no. And there were three main things that we, we asked for. We want to work on supply of housing to move that forward. We wanted to modernize the rules around real estate agents and transactions. The act is 15 years old, and we got that. And third, we said, if you're going to bring in a new tax, at least make sure that those who are contributing to our health or education system or growing our economy get exempted. So we actually batted three out of three. Okay. They, the new tax is the speculation tax? You got it, Which yeah. they only put on non-residents, not people who live here. Precisely. So you were content with that? Yeah. Like we, look, the view is taxes are already really high on housing as it is, even in Toronto with the double land transfer tax. Mm -hmm. We saw pretty early they're moving in the direction of a speculation tax. So I said, look, if somebody is coming here because they're going to go to U of T, She's going to get an MBA and maybe start her company in downtown Toronto. You want to exempt that. You've got a pediatric surgeon coming in from China or the U.S. who's going to work at SickKids. You don't want to tax that individual either. So they listen to us on the exemptions. Okay. In terms of modernizing rules, what were you content with there? Oh, we wanted this. One of the first things, so quick background on this. Mm -hmm. I was actually the minister that brought in the new act back in 2002 in the PC government to bring real estate rules into the... 21st century. <laughs> okay. Just barely. As it then was. Yeah. yeah. So, and we had all party support. And it was actually groundbreaking legislation for 2002. But 15 years later, consumers are far more sophisticated and demanding. New technology, social media didn't exist. So one of the first things I did when I got the new job was bring forward a call to government to modernize the rules. And we got that as part of the budget process too. So it's fantastic. You were consumer minister at the time. You right? got it. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Let's do, I mentioned those two things, which you know many people will never have heard of. So let's cover that. Double ending. What is that? Well, there's there's a technical term, and then there's what politicians mean. So I'll tell you both. The technical term means that if a brokerage is both the selling brokerage, so if you're selling your home, Steve, mm -hmm. and I'm buying it, that the brokerage is acting on behalf of both people in the transaction. That's the technical version of what's called multi-representation or double, double ending, ending for short. What's wrong with it? What politicians mean, okay, I'll just finish sorry. that part, is it's the same agent. So you're the agent and you're acting on the side of both the buyer and the seller. And it's problematic because? There's, there's certainly debate in certain circumstances in the real estate uh, community. There are tight rules around this, so I will say this. If there is going to be a deal that has the realtor on both sides of it, uh, the sales uh, person, then you have to have full consent. You have to brief people on what's called the client and what's called the customer. There are tight rules around it. But there have been examples, like Marketplace featured a while ago, of abuse in that process. Does it make sense to, re to uh, review these rules? Absolutely so. Okay. Paper flipping? What's that? Paper flipping basically means, okay, so I'm the builder, and I sell you a property, and then you go out and resell that property before it's complete. So there's the condos that are being built but not yet finished yet, or housing development. Minister Souza talked to me personally about this one, about people buying a block of houses or a row of condos in a building and then flipping them. He was concerned that is contributing to an acceleration in prices. Is he right about that? 
Here's one thing that was interesting to me that sort of blew me away when I left the world of politics to become the head of the Ontario Real Estate Association as CEO. Nobody knows. Like, there is not a single source of good data. If you ask me, Steve, how many foreign speculators there were in Toronto last year, nobody would have any clue. How many paper flips? Nobody knows. Getting good data is important to start with. That's what the government is going to do, so I'll give them kudos on that. But look, I think that there is something to be said here. They had the problem in Vancouver, where you had people who kept flipping houses and benefiting from increased value, and the original person who sell the house did not benefit it, hmm. benefit from that at all. So they made some real changes in BC, and we'll see if they're appropriate for Ontario. Does it make sense to be making new policy in the absence of data? I always prefer to have good data, but mm -hmm. I, I get the world of, of politics as well. And look, you couldn't go to barbecue anywhere in southern Ontario without people talking about real estate prices. Yeah. The biggest thing for us when we went to the table and had our three requests was, how are we going to make sure that that dream of home ownership is going to stay alive for the next generation? Like, I bought my first house in my early 30s. My buddies are kind of in the same neighborhood. It's awful tough today. So if there are measures we can bring in to help make sure that that dream stays affordable to the next generation, I'm all for it. I do want to raise the issue. I know that, I mean, technically, it's not necessarily part of the realty business, but you did mention supply as one of the three things that you asked the government to deal with. Uh, most of the criticism I've heard so far, so far rather, is about that part of the triad that they really didn't do much to encourage the creation of new housing supply. What's your view? Good start, more to come. There were more details that came out of the budget. So they made the, the 16 point announcement a week before the budget. That's when we got the three out of three. We saw more details of what we asked for. I'll give you some examples. Speeding up the approvals process. Like it takes way too long to get a new housing subdivision approved. It could be up to 10 years in some municipalities. So we got that. More of what's called the missing middle homes. And these are more affordable, so good starter homes for people. Maybe in Toronto, stacked um, townhomes in the GTA in Toronto, seven to nine stories. It's also really good for empty nesters. And when they move in there, stay close to the grandkids, mm. the traditional family home opens up for somebody else. So there was progress there. Would the realtors like to see more? Yeah, a lot more. But that was a big step forward, we thought, from where we were a year ago. Okay. They have also said that they're going to sort of generally review the rules that real estate agents are required to follow. Uh, do you have any sense about what that will entail? Yeah, because I've been part of that. Um, so let me give you some examples. So in 2002, when Minister Hudak was in charge, we brought in uh, a stronger regulator. But that regulator is really mired in a lot of um, process, in my view. So I term it they sort of sweat the small stuff, and they ignore some of the bigger issues. So when this marketplace thing happened, I inquired, saying, why aren't you going after these guys? And they say, well, we can only do it if there's an official complaint. And they were anonymized, right? Their faces were. I think they should have the ability to go in and investigate causes. Even without you, an official complaint? Yeah. Well, okay. like, if, you, if you know something is happening, why can't you investigate and circle around it? Secondly, even if they're caught, Steve, the fines are now in 2017 dollars so low, it's, worse, it's worth the cost of, of doing business if you yeah. get a slap on the wrist. For example, they, what's called disgorgement of proceeds. So if you made $50,000 by breaking the rules, you should have to pay that $50,000 back plus a fine. And if you do it again, lose your license, get kicked out. Quite frankly, the bars of entry in this profession are too low and it's too hard to kick people out who are breaking the rules. I was going to ask you about that. You do think the bar of entry is too low? Yeah. How, how would you raise it? The education program we've had uh, and we currently deliver it. The government basically sets out the parameters through what's called RICO, the Real Estate Council. That's the regulator. But um, it, it's, it takes not enough time to go through. There should be some sort of trial period where you're working for an experienced realtor, by way of example. I hear this idea all the time from other realtors, whether it's an apprenticeship type of term or a, uh, an internship before you start dealing in million, two million dollar hmm. houses. You should know the art of negotiation. I don't think we do enough in that because that's a big part um, of the deal. Real estate transactions are so complex that if you can do it in six to nine months, in my view, and what I hear from my members, that's not nearly enough. How many members you got? 70,000 realtors across realtors the province. in the province, and about 42,000 in the GTA. And when I talk to the, the leaders in my community, it's a 99% or they say we've got to raise the bar. Because there's too many people getting in who get in too quickly and it's too easy and they don't have the skills and they it's give complex. the profession a bad name? Yeah, like uh, negotiations. Like, look, you're sitting down with 20 other realtors mm -hmm. bidding on a house in Toronto these days. Right? That takes some skill on how you're going to do that. 
when you look at a standard uh, uh, offer, there's a lot of different clauses in there. You've got to know those inside and out to represent your client. Can they get proper financing? This is not an easy job. And if you want a duty of care to your client, you should know the rules inside and out and then go a bit farther. So a big part of what we have asked for is to substantially raise the bar in education. And if you want me to talk about it, continuing education as well. Uh, well, okay. Uh, I, I guess I'm really curious about whether you, as an association, have any power to deal with unsavory practices or bad agents. Do you? No. You can't kick them out. We do have, um, so there is, some states and provinces have a code of ethics, and nationally there's a code of ethics to use the term realtor. So that avenue exists. In Ontario, we have a code of ethics that's actually in regulation, so part of the legislative process. So there would be a greater ability, I think, if the regulator, as the judge, could kick it below. Right now, it is awfully difficult to do so. Mm -hmm. I think that if you're going to betray somebody's trust, and look, as I said, the, 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 the realtors I got to know um, love their clients. There's nothing that makes them happier than putting somebody into their dream home. But for those that abuse the rules and take advantage of somebody in that situation, we don't want them in the profession. What about the consumer? I mean, part of this as well is educating people on what their rights and obligations and responsibilities are in a real estate transaction. Where do you think the current gaps exist between what people do know and what they need to know as consumers? So we do a book, but who reads books these days in that, right? Maybe some will. Uh, we can do a better job, I think, with technology and app and sort of here's the things to watch out for and when you're going through the process and its complexity. The most important thing I'd say is get a good experienced realtor Right? Like nobody's going to know the neighborhood how to navigate a deal better, particularly in a market like we've had this past year, than somebody that works the street every day and knows where things are going and knows how to advance your interests. You can do it alone. It's not the law. But I think you're going to leave hundreds of thousands of dollars on the table in this market if you don't use a good, experienced realtor. Third, our regulator does public promotion and education side of the coin. But I think you know the most important thing to do, revisit the act, bring it into the 20, 2017 <laughs> framework. And that's going to be better for consumers as well as for the profession. Do you have an undertaking from the government they're going to do that? We do. We've been engaged in conversations from the get-go. We brought up the Premier herself, the Finance Minister, and they greenlighted that as part of the budget. So I'm excited about it. Okay. A couple of minutes to go here, Tim. And I want to ask you, what sort of specific next steps do you want to see uh, for the housing market in the province of Ontario? So um, we talked a lot. So thank you about the profession and making sure that when you make that investment, you've got the best advice out there. Um, secondly, so here's some more examples. So infrastructure funding is announced as part of the budget. That's a good thing. The government's putting, like outside of the studio, a lot under the ground in terms of rail and subway and LRTs. Why not attach infrastructure investments to where there is land ready that's been approved for housing to help accelerate that process? Speed up the approvals process that can go on for a long time. We also have a one-size-fits-all planning approach, places to grow, which kind of takes a young and Eglinton footprint but puts it throughout the GTA. Instead, let's give local decision makers on council greater flexibility to say what the local market is going to demand. So if you have a one size fits all, that's actually restricting supply and restricting choice. Finally, does it hurt your soul to have to say such nice things about li <laughs> the Liberal government of Ontario? Well, <laughs> um, you know what? It, I, I, it comes pretty naturally because I've got a lot of respect for people who act who put aside whatever career they are on for public service. You did spend five years every single day of your life saying what a bunch of miscreants they and were. And it though. dragged me down. It wasn't me, man. <laughs> I could be myself. Um, the, the, so, you know, to their credit, um, they did listen to a lot of the realtor uh, advice we put on the table. There's more to do on the supply side. Like, I'll give you an example. In 2007, there were 18,000 single-family homes put on the market in February 2007. 2017, Steve? 1,500. 1,500, I heard so that. So you yes, see indeed. that kind of yeah. drop, right? No wonder prices are going up. Yeah. And there's a lot of reasons, good reasons why demand has gone up. But does it hurt me to say that? No, I, you know what? They listened to us. They took a lot of our advice and hopefully more in the future. So I'm glad to say it. And I'm glad to thank you for coming into TVO tonight and helping us out with this. Thanks good to a see lot. you again. My pleasure. Tim Hudak, now CEO, Ontario Real Estate Association. Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning. Visit TVO.org and make a tax-deductible donation today.